Thank you, everybody. I'm Sivani Dada Barua at Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And I'd like to thank the session chairs for inviting me to give this talk. Um, we've been talking a lot about natural hazards uh, all day and all, all workshop. Uh, I would like to talk about some extraterrestrial natural hazards that maybe um, you, you haven't thought too much about in the past. Uh, and, and that's this area that we call space weather. And GNSS has had uh, has been profoundly influenced and impacted by it and has in return also been a key asset in, in understanding it. So I'll start off by saying, uh, telling you first of all, you know, the, the question you might be asking is what is space weather as a, as a phrase? I mean, we all know about weather that you see on your local uh, uh, meteorology report and so on, but space weather sort of refers to conditions on the sun, uh, in terms of electromagnetic radiation and charged particles that stream out from the sun through the solar wind uh, to Earth and then impact our, um, uh, our magnetic field, the, the magnetosphere, and those charged particles get sent down uh, into the, the magnetic polar regions here, the aurora. That's maybe the most obvious um, visible manifestation that, that uh, we encounter. Uh, but there are uh, any number of um, uh, effects, and in particular, space weather refers to those effects that end up uh, impacting our technological systems. So um, global navigation satellite systems, of which GPS is one, is one of the, the primary ones, but there's also uh, satellite operations that are affected, uh, communications, navigation that are needed for, for aviation. Um, power grids are electrical uh, sort of continent-wide um, transmission and distribution centers uh, are, are affected by space weather. And there are also biological effects, and this is uh, in terms of radiation exposure at high altitudes. So, uh, you know, the space age has only really gone on for about 50 years, uh, but historically we have had um, space weather events, I would, I would claim, um, and still the largest one uh, on record happened in September of 1859. Uh, it's known as the Carrington event. It's named after the astronomer Richard Carrington who was actually observing the sunspot region, and this is his uh, uh, artist drawing uh, published in the Royal Astronomical Society of a very complicated sunspot region, and then these two, uh, he described them as kidney beans, that they, they were the bright flashes associated with um, a flare, a solar flare, that then also um, blasted charged particles towards Earth such that two days later in the New York Times, uh, they were reporting aurora as far uh, equatorward as in the northern hemisphere, Cuba and Mexico, that's where the aurora were visible, and uh, in the southern hemisphere as far north as uh, northern Australia. And so those were visible, but not only that, the telegraph operators on the eastern seaboard noticed that they could actually operate and send transmissions without running their battery powers. Basically, there were currents induced in the telegraph lines uh, because of all those charged particles uh, in, our, in our upper atmosphere. And uh, so they were able to do these tests and experiments, and some of them actually, unfortunately, got severely burned by some of the, uh, the interactions. So this is still the largest event on record, and, and so this is one that when people talk about extreme space weather events, they, they sort of refer to the Carrington event, and, and is this the equivalent of a 100-year flood or a 500-year flood in terms of space weather? Um, more recently, there was a, a geomagnetic storm in 1989 that uh, affected all of uh, eastern uh, Canada, the Hydro-Quebec uh, power company uh, experienced severe uh, outage for or service for their, for their users for about nine hours. And effectively what happened was, if you're looking at their transformers, this is sort of a, a sequence or a stack of coils uh, in their uh, transformers that were effectively um, uh, fr you know, fried, melted, um, because of the currents induced in them. And so, um, so th this has happened historically, it, it happens more recently. Um, and, you know, the phrase space weather hasn't existed that long. What, what we as uh, scientists probably more typically referred to it as is sort of um, uh, space science, geospace, uh, the, the geospace environment. Uh, and it really stems from um, the, the 
uh, solar radiation, the uh, EUV, and uh, the, the charged particles that are then carried along in the solar wind and, as I mentioned, feed in in the high latitudes. This is where our, our dipole field lines come in to the northern and southern hemispheres, and that's where the charged particles get routed into. And this is kind of an iconic uh, photograph or, or image in, in our research community, uh, mostly just to, uh, to illustrate how complex the, the activities are, because essentially what you have is uh, charged particles, which are sort of indicated by the uh, white arrows, ions and electrons, free plasma in, in the upper atmosphere, that uh, are subject to electromagnetic forcing, but they also collide with the neutral at atmosphere. So that's uh, indicated by the yellow. And so this interaction creates all kinds of interesting effects. And, and Aaron sort of uh, uh, talked about some of that earlier in terms of uh, the gravity waves that you see from, from thunderstorms actually appearing in, in ionospheric signature. Um, so this is, there's, there's a whole um, zoo of, of events and activities and, and uh, phenomena that, that cause space weather that we are we're, uh, very interestedly investigating. Um, on the other hand, space weather as a phrase hasn't really existed that long. So if you'll excuse me, this very rough, kind of tongue-in-cheek tongue um, uh, comparison, this is a Google books, sort of n-gram you know, viewer, so how many, how many times has a particular word appeared in all of the scanned print uh, that, that Google documents over time? So this is going back uh, to 1800, uh, out through about 2008 or so, and the, the, the percentage appearance of a particular phrase. And so here's space weather in blue. And it's really since the mid-90s that that has increased in usage. There are, I, I punched in a couple, a couple other phrases, solar storm, geomagnetic storm, and, and they, they haven't really had that same uh, uh, trend. But on the other hand, if you look at the phrase global positioning system, that also has the same trend. And so uh, I find that uh, interesting, and, and my point is that the I think because GPS, or more broadly GNSS, has become a multi-billion dollar uh, industry worldwide, and this is actually a market report produced by uh, the European GNSS uh, agency, uh, talking about projected um, uh, markets from 2015 to 2025. Um, I think because of the wide array of, of consumer uses um, and their, their uses in critical uh, needs. So, for example, um, I don't know if you can see this, but they, they list a couple of, of primary um, uh, uses of GNSS. Um, Location-based services is maybe one that we might all be very used to because those are the kinds of uh, things that are tied to your cell phone apps, saying, oh, you're, you're near such and such, you want to go to that cafe that's right around the corner from you. Um, uh, but, you know, there are, there are civilian uh, infrastructure, roadways, maritime uh, um, transit, uh, surveying, of course, and then timing and synchronization, and this is needed for uh, electrical grids, this is needed for um, uh, the, the financial markets, that synchronization ends up being pretty critical. And so uh, I, I will sort of claim that space weather, because uh, GPS and GNSS has, have become so embedded uh, in our techno technology, uh, that, that space weather as a phrase didn't really exist because it wasn't really on people's um, uh, radar as much. And but now we are sensitive to many of these things uh, in the in terms of the everyday um, consumer and and uh, applications that we use. And so um, GNSS is susceptible to the space weather, and I'll talk a little bit about how. So it you know it is sort of. Uh, impacted or diseased by it, but it is also uh, a really, really uh, invaluable resource for kind of a cure for it. So it's, it's kind of this really interesting paradox or, or, or symbiotic relationship. And um, on the right here, I'm just showing um, the, the fact that this has now become enough of a national priority that the National Science and Technology Council just a couple of years ago um, published a national space weather strategy and a national space weather action plan, and that this is an area that has as yet sort of uh, unanimous support um, within the, the Congress and administrations. So um, I think uh, first I'll tell you a little bit about the, the space weather impact on GNSS. I think Aaron actually gave an introduction about this, but I'll just uh, 
just refresh. Um, basically, the way that um, the ionosphere affects GNSS is through refraction. So basically, when you have a, a I can use the when you have a, a GPS satellite, it sends a signal. It's received down here on the ground by a receiver, and the receiver me measures the transit time between when the signal was sent and when it's received, and it multiplies that by a speed of light and gets a range. And that works very well while the signal is traveling through the vacuum of space, but then when you get into the upper atmosphere, the index of refraction is no longer unity. And in fact, the amount that it deviates from unity is proportional to the electron density within that region of the, the ionosphere. So the, the free electrons um, uh, will slow down the, the GNSS signal. Um, and it's also proportional or inversely proportional to the square of the, the transmitted signal's frequency. So uh, what, what uh, ends up happening is that, slow, that slowing down, that delay accumulates as the signal travels through from the satellite to the receiver. And that accumulation uh, or that total delay is then proportional to the column integrated total electron content. And so the ionospheric error that one gets is proportional to the total electron content along the ray path. And so I think if you're using this in the geodesy community, if you have two frequencies, because this is dispersive, you can actually eliminate and you can produce an ionospheric free combination. But for those of us in, in sort of upper atmospheric science, we're interested in that. that your, your noise is our signal. So we actually measure to, act, to, to compute what that total electron content is. And um, now for, for users, the impact of the ionosphere is that if you're, if you're a user and you're using this to navigate, typically you're getting a range to one satellite and that uh, dictates a particular um, range or circle that, that you reside on. And the intersection of ranges to mul multiple satellites, you're, you're located there. That's your best estimate. And so if there is instead the slowing down such that you get a longer range, then you estimate a different location. And so that's a loss of accuracy. And for, for many applications, well, it depends on the application, um, whether that's a, a concern or not. If you're an aircraft in uh, en route navigation, and it's not really that much of a concern, what matters, um, particularly as you're coming in on approach or landing, is the uncertainty on that. And so uh, if there's uncertainty about where you're located, that's the thing that can lead to problems. So we're very interested in not only trying to um, estimate the ionosphere more accurately, but have a better handle on what the uncertainties are on them as well. Um, and the ionosphere is not the only error source. In fact, uh, the previous talk uh, uh, by uh, Jun Wang ju just introduced the troposphere. That's another um, uh, error source in, in uh, a GPS signal. And uh, that is the one by which you can actually then measure the, the precipitable water vapor content as well. So. Um, the point is that, uh, I guess on the flip side, so because GPS is uh, affected or, or users, single frequency users can be affected by these ionospheric errors, um, you can set up GPS arrays for monitoring the ionosphere in real time. And so the Federal Aviation Administration uh, has uh, fielded their wide area augmentation system, which is a, a network of receivers across the conterminous United States, Alaska, and uh, Mexico. And they uh, broadcast um, at regularly spaced grid points their, their best estimates of the ionosphere and the uncertainties. And so these, these uh, regularly spaced uh, boxes are uh, color coded to the uncertainty. And so the magenta corresponds to a high level of uncertainty uh, on what the ionosphere um, uh, error is there. And when those errors are large, uh, in contrast to the dark green where the errors are low, then any airport on the ground, and this is just overlaid with hundreds of airports on the ground, they can no longer um, use that service uh, for precision approach and landing. So they then rely on the other navigation systems. And this is a safety mechanism. But the point is that um, during when there is ionospheric activity uh, due to a storm, then much of the, the 
uh, CONUS region has, has lost their, uh, the, the GNSS as a precision approach navigation uh, tool. And so if you want to see what's actually going on in the ionosphere, you can actually take those um, uh, stations across the U.S. that we're monitoring, you take their measurements of the total electron content, and uh, you can convert them all uh, to an equivalent vertical total electron content uh, in, in terms of those TEC units Aaron introduced of 10 to the 16 electrons per meter squared, and you get kind of a color map of Effectively, this is how much plasma there is in the ionosphere above the United States at that time. And so you can, you can see here there's this sort of uh, tongue of ionization. It comes up, and if you line those up, well, that's exactly the region that the real-time monitoring is detecting and saying this ionosphere is not varying smoothly, therefore we have to... Um, uh, we, we are more uncertain about what it's, the, the actual behavior is. And so this is useful for real-time warning. This is important for understanding physical processes. And where we're going uh, now is in integrating those data from these networks to be able to forecast accurately enough for operational systems. And so the, the reverse impact here is that you can use those dual-frequency GNSS arrays to actually then try to estimate plasma drivers. And so this is an image of um, a data assimilation tool that we've uh, been developing that takes the total electron content image and looks at how that changes over time and then tries to back out what the, the uh, plasma motion is from one time step to the next. And there are a number of, of these global assimilative models that are, that are in use, and they, they rely on these dual frequency uh, GPS or GNSS networks. So another uh, impact that uh, uh, space weather has on uh, GNSS is effectively diffraction. And so um, even if you have two frequencies and you say, okay, well, I, with two frequencies, I can measure out the the ionospheric delay, I don't have to worry about it anymore. There is still this effect of diffraction whereby a plane wave arriving uh, from the satellite passes through the layer of the atmosphere, but because it has these uh, irregularities, variations in density on the order of 100 to 1,000 meters uh, in, in size, you end up getting, uh, your plane wave ends up getting distorted, and that can lead to basically constructive or destructive interference. And so if this is received on the ground, depending on the kind of receiver that you have, what that shows up as over, over time, so this is a, a two hour um, span of time, uh, this is then the signal to noise ratio as measured to each of three receivers, excuse me, each of three satellites. And what you'll see is a, a drop in the uh, signal to noise ratio effectively as that uh, constructive and destructive interference uh, basically, the signal is twinkling, and the, the receiver cannot necessarily continue to, to track the satellite. Uh, on the other hand, there are other receivers and other techniques that can be used where they are then unaffected uh, by such variations. And so these are two receivers um, in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, and Gakona, Alaska. This is from uh, Jade Morton, and this one from the WAS network. Uh, that were collected at the same time to the same receivers uh, and uh, impacted differently by uh, scintill the scintillation. So we can turn this around yet again and say, okay, so if you can have the kind of receiver that can track through scintillation, you can actually set up arrays of these and start to investigate those irregularities. So now that diffraction pattern that you see on the ground becomes effectively um, it contains information about those irregularities. For example, it can tell you about the drift speed and direction that the irregularities are moving through the ionospheric layer. Um, and the other thing that I didn't mention, I'll go back here, is that these uh, irregularities exist at some altitude uh, and have some thickness as well in, in terms of diffraction theory uh, modeling. And so what you can do with a scintillation array, if you have a, a number of receivers at baselines of 100 meters to a, a couple kilometers maybe, is you can then actually make estimates over time of the, the drift, uh, the horizontal drift speed and direction, and you can even start to get at 
where, in terms of altitude and thickness, the uh, uh, irregularities are in the ionosphere. And this is something that you cannot directly image right now. There are no um, all-sky cameras with the, the resolution. I mean, that they just wouldn't actually even respond to these irregularities. So um, where we are going with this, oh, and one last comment. So this, this is data that we have uh, had in, a, in an array, a closely spaced array, in poker flat research range in Alaska um, since late 2013, and we're still collecting data with that now. Um, happy to go into details and, and uh, share it with anybody who's interested. We have it available on our uh, website, which I don't think I actually included. Um, but where we are going with this um, as the upper atmospheric science uh, and space physics community is towards a space weather observation network, and this is just about the end here. Um, space weather observation network and I think there is um, interest as a, as a community in developing uh, akin to UNAVCO, so this is just a, this is a snapshot of the, the UNAVCO uh, sites right now, but a collection of stations fielded that contain multiple sensors and they have heterogeneous measurements that we can then start to compile into uh, some sort of uh, forecasting framework. And this is not a new idea in our community. There's been a number of workshop reports about 10 years ago, the distributed arrays of small instruments, the DAISY report. And then more recently, uh, there was a, a workshop sort of called Quo Vadis, just as where, where are we going in terms of really getting towards geospace uh, forecasting and, and understanding of those physics. So um, that's, that's, I think, the exciting areas where things are going. You need dual frequency um, or more. And then if you can really get at this high rate data, which I showed, that was 50 hertz uh, data from which those estimates are derived. Um, so in conclusion, um, basically, this is a, this is a two-way street. Space weather uh, is basically the refraction and diffraction of GNSS signals. It affects precision uh, and uh, uh, you know, safety in real-time applications and continuity of service. Uh, in the presence of something like scintillation. Um, but on the other hand, the GNSS, uh, with arrays of these, or, or even single stations, you can actually start to look at the global ionospheric response. You can look at um, physics, the, the fundamental um, principles and, and physics processes in the upper atmosphere. And you can start to actually uh, infer those properties that are going on. Um, and so my, my claim uh, with this talk is that space weather would not really be so embedded in our, in our public perception if GNSS weren't so embedded in our everyday lives. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you very much. We have time for two, two questions. Are there any questions? Yes, yeah, so the question was, um, have we looked at occultation and uh, uh, its role in tomography? I personally have not, but I think when you are looking at a true assimilative framework um, with just ground-based receivers, you don't get enough spatial variability for tomography that, that you need in tomography to really resolve altitude variations. And that's where the occultations really help you a lot. There are a number of, uh, so the cosmic satellites have a significant bank of occultations and they give you, they give you more of that vertical, or, sorry, yes, the vertical variations, um, but there are a number of assumptions in there. I'm not doing that specifically, but thanks. <clears throat> Any other question? Yes, sure. So at, at least with the GNSS uh, instruments, there's a lot of overlap between what we would want to do for solid earth or atmospheric, uh, neutral atmosphere studies, as well as people for ionospheric studies. Uh, but we haven't always coordinated as well as possible. So. Um, particularly as the space weather community is actually trying to sort of build up organizations like this, it would be great if we could actually work together and uh, find ways to leverage some resources. Because I think in many cases, it might take a slightly different hardware, but totally compatible to both people's uh, 
uh, needs. Yeah, um, so I, I think that's a really great point. Thank you for, for uh, bringing it up. Um, but uh, yeah, I think at least our community, I, I know as a graduate student, I, I think I uh, used UNAVCO um, data sites and acknowledged myself those sites. And going forward with something like this, a, a collaborative framework would, would help us get some of the, the ground instrumentation we need. Um, for something like scintillation, um, I know Septemtrio is out there, and, and they have one, one of their receiver models does do scintillation monitoring, but not all of them do. And so in, in terms of existing stations, they wouldn't necessarily always have that. But it would be great to continue that conversation. Um, the, the Space Weather Observing Network, we're going to have a number of um, community workshops in the coming year. Um, the, the next one is at the NSF CEDAR workshop. CEDAR stands for Coupling, Energetics, and Dynamics of Atmospheric Regions. That happens in late June. Uh, and we're really going to try and nail down what are the kinds of measurements we would want, what are the kinds of things we'd want to look at. Um, you know, just at, a, at the public interest level, it would be what would it take to actually be able to give people forecasts of, hey, you'll be able to see the aurora over your sky? And, and, and you know, there are people who, who um, have, uh, Liz McDonald has a citizen science project called Aurorasaurus that does that kind of real time. You know, uh, if you have uh, Twitter, you can go and sign up and everybody tweets when they see or don't see aurora in their particular location. But uh, yeah, coordination is, is key. Ah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, that's really good to know, and it'd be great to talk with you uh, offline about that. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm also from NOAA, oh, okay. and um, we also have the Space Weather Prediction Center. That's right. And um, we, we do. do have a GPS dashboard for space weather, and I wanted to encourage you um, to speak to the vendors like Septemtrio, because they only have, you know, it's very several instruments that have scintillation. So if the universities could encourage that measurement with the vendors, I think it would greatly benefit our community. So, so that's, a, that's a really good point. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. The, the SWPSI is an um, important resource uh, within the community. Um, I think one of the interesting things right now is that um, in, the, in the GNSS world, things are moving towards somewhat towards software receivers. So we still don't quite know what is the best design of receiver to be able to monitor scintillation. So the thing, the idea behind a scintillation receiver is you can um, do all of the receiver processing that's normally you know, um, just programmed onto your, your chips there. You can do them post-process uh, on, uh, on your laptop and, and try and figure out what are the bandwidths I need to use in order to be able to maintain lock. And, and a lot of those scintillation properties do end up being pretty receiver specific. So that, that's a challenge there. But yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.